Welcome everybody. This is the, uh, you got this webinar. We're going to be talking about mindset and habits tonight and how to get the best out of the challenge that we've been doing and how to have the best year of your life when it comes to your health. So appreciate everybody being on. We're going to give everybody a couple minutes to get rolling and then we will kick off. Everybody could go ahead and mute too. That would be great. You should be muted already, but. Should be muted when you check in. And then we'll open up for some questions uh, in a little bit as well. Still got some people joining, so we'll give it just a couple minutes and we will get rolling. Got a couple people joining. So we'll go to about a minute and then I will jump in. <clears throat> Got some great stuff for you tonight. Really excited to be with you. Um, we're going to open up again for some questions in the chat at the end. So if you have any questions on anything you learned at the makeover uh, last week on the 14th, and then anything that's going on through the challenge, if you have any questions about the 30 day you know, eating plan, anything like that. This would be a good time to get some questions answered there, but I'm going to give you some, we're going to go beyond that too. We're going to talk a lot about mindset as well and how to make sure um, that you're, that you're making these, these things stick. So mindset and habits is going to be the main focus for tonight. All right. Okay, so I am going to get my uh, my screen shared with you guys here so you, everybody can see uh, what exactly we're doing. So I'll get that rolling in a second, and then we will we'll hop right into it. Welcome, Patty and Patty. All right. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started. Uh, let me hop into this for us. Okay. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, as I as we get rolling here, uh, I'm actually going to uh, talk about how we can make the things stick that we want to achieve in our lives and and with our with our health and our vitality. Um, this, these really are your secret weapons. Cause I, I think a lot of us know, Hey, we shouldn't eat sugar. We're not supposed to eat McDonald's. Uh, we're not supposed to eat pizza every night. Um, we all know that an apple good as good and a donut is bad, but the problem is we choose that donut far too often. And that really comes down to the six inches between your ears. So I'm going to teach you what I think is the most important thing that I've used to eat well and stay healthy and be far healthier than anybody in my family has ever been to this point. Um, and same thing, develop that in my family and really have an excitement for my future because of these things that I'm going to teach you tonight. So um, the first thing I want to discuss is like, what is really going on inside of your brain and how to stop sabotaging yourself? Because I, I think so many times our thoughts and our mind and the chatter that we have and the things that we tell ourselves and our limiting beliefs, those things are what keep us stuck. And you don't have to listen to your mind when it's telling you negative things. So I'm going to get into how you can you can avoid that because when you when your mind is telling you, oh, I will never succeed at this, or this is too hard, or I don't like to eat this, or I deserve to eat that piece of cake, or um, this I don't have time to shop, or this isn't going to work anyway, or I've never succeeded in the past, and you fill in the blank for all those limiting beliefs. I want you to understand that you are in control of those things, right? And, and one of my favorite quotes from Jim Rohn is, he says, you can have um, results or you can have excuses, but you can't have both. 
And when I say the word excuse, I don't mean like I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I have excuses just like everybody else does. But I work really hard over confronting those excuses and, and, and getting those out of the way and clearing out those what you call reasons or excuses that are going to keep me stuck. So what we want the brain to be able to do and the mind to be able to do is to be clear so it can accept new habits and new, um, new behaviors and new information. So what I see when I work with people with nutrition over the years is a lot of people, their, their mind looks like this cluttered garage. There's just no, there's no room to put new habits in there. There's no room to put new procedures in there. There's no room to put new ideas in there. There's no room to put new thoughts in there because it's just full of clutter, right? And that clutter sounds like just yammering at you all the time with this, you know, the limiting beliefs and what the, I got to do this. And there's just, we get the really cluttered mind. And what we want to do is develop this very clear mind and clear goals on what we want to achieve with our health. Because health really is your most important asset. Like I went through it at the workshop. Steve Jobs died with you know $10 billion and he would have given every penny of that to be alive. So your health is more important than your money. Your health is more important than your time. And, but a lot of times we put our health on the back burner and then we expect it's always gonna be there for us later, but we see clearly it's not. So what we wanna do today is, or tonight is teach you how to clean up that garage to where now you can fit a two, two cars in there. You can fit a, a car and a motorcycle in there. You can do whatever you want in that garage. You can go work out in that garage. Whereas before you couldn't do that. So today is about gonna be cleaning up your mindset and cleaning up your mind so that you have the space within your mind to make these changes. And I see that is the key for a lot of people is creating the space. Now, in order to do that, um, I always look at, this is a great book by uh, Carolyn Dweck. It's called um, Mindset is the name of the book. If you haven't read it, it's a great book to read. But she talks about the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And people fall into one of two categories. You're either growth mindset person or fixed mindset person. Now, it doesn't mean you're stuck there. It just means that's how you operate. Your operating system is either a growth mindset, your core beliefs are growth mindset or fixed mindset. So fixed mindset. And here's the, the reason that you want to be a growth mindset person. There's been all kinds of studies on positive psychology, which is the whole side of this, this, this arm of psychology. Regular psychology works on disease, right? So you have anxiety, you have depression, let's treat this disease, let's figure out what to do with it, which can be useful. But positive psychology actually looks at, hey, what's, what's great about you? What's possible for you? What are your strengths, not just your weaknesses? And so when they do studies on growth versus fixed mindset, the people with a fixed mindset that operate from that type of mindset and, and they have that as their default mechanism, those people are happier. Um, they live longer. They're more fulfilled in life. Um, they laugh more. They have better relationships. Basically, they have everything that you want right now happens in the growth mindset. So in, in, the, in the fixed mindset, we'll start there first. And this is where a lot of people live. It's a scarcity mindset. It's based on fear. It's based on the past. Um, and that's and that's why people stay stuck. So when you when you try to change your diet, but then you 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 slip back to where you were, and everybody's experienced this. It's because you're operating usually from a fixed mindset. So fixed mindset, the the, the chief assumption there is intelligence is static, which means hey, this is just how I am. And I'm not just talking about intelligence like you know facts. I'm talking about intelligence in terms of I can use my brain to accomplish something. And, the, and you think is, you know, my intelligence is static. This, I'm just how I am. This is how I was born. Here are my limitations. This is me. And in that mindset, you avoid challenges. So instead of embracing challenges, you avoid challenges. So you say things like, that's too hard. That's too difficult. I don't want to do this. I don't like to be told this, whatever. So you avoid challenges. Um, and then you also say things like, it's too hard. That's too hard for me to do. That's, it's too hard for me to, to make foods. It's, oh, that's too much trouble to go to the grocery store or whatever. And for every time you have one of those excuses, you'll think, well, you know what, this is legitimate because I work really hard, but there's somebody who works just as hard and has just as many time demands as you that does make it to the store, right? And it just comes back to why, why? so do you really have a big enough why to make this happen? Um, so we say things like it's too hard. We expect reward without effort. And everybody is in this fixed mindset at some point in their life, okay? So this is, you can oscillate between these two, but I work really hard to make sure that I am in this growth mindset. Um, so you expect reward without effort. So you want a quick fix. You want something to just be quick. So I want to, I want to take a pill for, to lose weight, or I want to do liposuction or something like that. So reward without effort. Um, you ignore feedback. Okay. Instead of embracing feedback, you ignore feedback. You don't want to hear, you know, something that might challenge you. And then a lot of times in this, this place, you're, these people are threatened by the success of others. Um, so these people are like, oh, look at her. She lost that weight. I don't, you know, she's just, you know, she's lucky or, or she, you know, I, I can't do that because of X, Y, or Z. So we're threatened by those things. And 
people get that are threatened by other people's success, it's usually because there's a scarcity mindset. There's not enough to go around. But you really want to have the belief that there's more than enough success to go around. There's if you can do it, I can do it, right? If you got a ton of money, man. I can make a ton of money. If you lost this weight, I can lose this weight. If you know whatever it is. So the growth mindset embraces challenges. So you're actually looking at a challenge as a way to build your mental muscle, to build your willpower, to build your skill power. Um, that you're able to train your brain. So instead of saying it's too hard, you say, I train my brain to get this done because I know I can do it. I just need to train my brain better. Um, and instead of looking for no effort, right? So I don't want to, I want to put minimal effort. You, you think of effort as the path to mastery, you know? So even though this thing is challenging, even though this thing might be daunting, effort is the path to mastery. And I'm going to put that effort in because I'm going to overcome something called Olympic friction, which I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. This is the way you start to build these habits. You always want feedback. You learn from feedback. You try out, you have trial and error. You learn, you learn from feedback and then you create these feedback loops to get stronger. And then you're inspired by the success of other years. You're rooting for other people to do well. And instead of looking at them going, oh man, if they have something that missed me and I can't get it, or there's not enough for me. So we want to have this and adopt this growth mindset really in all areas of your life. But you definitely want to do this when you're trying to establish habits of healthy eating, exercise, making the changes that you want to make and living the lifestyle that you want. You want this growth mindset, embracing challenges, training your brain, believing that intelligence, this area, any skill can be developed. You can develop anything you set your mind to. You learn from feedback and you're inspired by, by the success of others. Okay. So I, I talked about this a little bit at the workshop, the three layers of behavioral change, because that's really everything we're talking about tonight is how do you change your behavior and why can it seem so hard to change your behavior? Well, there's, they've actually, again, done studies and found out what is the biggest lever to pull when it comes to changing your behavior. So what's taking, you know, when doing these things, that's going to give you the biggest chance of making the behavior change that you want. And the, on the outside ring of the bullseye is outcomes. Okay, so if you're just trying to get an outcome, that's that's a start, but it's not the most powerful lever that you can pull. Okay, so outcome would be like, I want to run a 5k or I want to lose 10 pounds. Okay, so let's talk, I talked about the 5k thing at the workshop. Let's talk about losing 10 pounds. I want to lose 10 pounds. Okay, now that can be a motivator. Um, unfortunately, that's short term motivation usually doesn't last that long. You think, well, I want to eat this cheeseburger more than I want to lose this 10 pounds. So I'll just go ahead and do this instead. It just doesn't pull enough of a lever it doesn't have enough leverage for you. But when you get into processes, okay, so processes pull a much longer lever. So they actually make a bigger swing towards this behavioral change. Processes are Okay, so you say, I want to lose 10 pounds, but you don't stop there. You move into processes. So what do I need to do, right? What do I need to do to lose those 10 pounds? Well, I need to start um, reading food labels. I need to start trying to keep my carbohydrates down under 150 grams a day. I need to start preparing meals instead of eating out um, at, the, at a restaurant. I need to start, um, you know, maybe I want to start intermittent fasting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn these processes. Maybe it's meal preparation. Maybe it's intermittent fasting. Maybe it's um, you know, reading food labels, maybe it's going to the grocery store, or maybe it's sitting down and, or having an accountability partner. All those things are processes. And those processes are habits. Those are very powerful for your brain. They actually start to wire your brain. So if you do those processes long enough, then eventually you get to the center of the bullseye, which is identity. So then you become this person. Instead of, so instead of saying, I want to lose 10 pounds, or I want to start reading food labels, you start saying, I want to become a lean, healthy person. I want to be, become someone who eats well. I want to become somebody, you know, who makes good choices. So you want your identity becomes that. And that becomes very hard to pull you out of that lifestyle because it's now your identity. My identity is that I am a lean, healthy person. So I might not, I might go out and eat a pizza and, and have a couple of beers one night, but I'm still in my identity. I'm a lean, healthy person. So what am I going to do the next day? I'm not going to do more pizza and beers. I'm going to get back. Oh, okay. That was, that was fun, but I'm going to get back to what I do every day, what I become. And that's what were the magic in this, in this next, you know, 30 days is you can really build these habits and you can build a new identity. That's where the strongest lever is that you can pull in your, uh, in your lifestyle. So the, the easiest way to do this and to start becoming this is what's called keystone habits. Okay, so we're going to start about talk about this, this second layer, which again, is a pretty powerful layer. So processes could also be called habits. There's a great book called um, Atomic Habits. And then there, he talks about keystone habits, which are habits that then spur other habits. And, and so if you can do this one thing, it's going to make a lot of changes, it's going to knock over a lot of dominoes in your life. So this is how exercise is a keystone habit. So I'll show you this as an example. 
So let's say you start exercising. So you make a, you say, okay, I'm going to do my surge training six days a week, or I'm going to go to the gym four days a week, or I'm going to take a class four days a week at the gym. And I'm going to do that. Right. So let's just go back to, I'm going to, I'm going to start doing my surge training six days a week. So because I do that, so if I think about that, I don't want to eat, I'm say I'm going to do that in the morning. I don't want to eat a junky breakfast because I realize when I get my heart rate up, I'm going to start burping. My stomach's going to hurt. I'm not going to feel well. So because I know, hey, I'm committed to exercising tomorrow or this morning after breakfast, I'm going to eat something healthier for breakfast because I need to exercise. So do you see how exercise then spawns a healthier diet and better food choices? Because I exercised, I'm going to burn calories. My hormones are going to work better. I'm going to set myself up for more melatonin at night. So I'm going to sleep better. So when I sleep better, I'm going to have more energy. When I sleep better, I have more energy. I'm going to have increased improved mood. So when I have improved mood, I'm going to have a bigger uh, chance of tomorrow being in a good mood so that I will exercise. Because it's hard to exercise if you're in a crappy mood. You don't feel good and you're depressed, right? So because I exercise, I sleep better, I have more energy, my mood's improved, I go back to exercising more. And because I exercise more, I'm going to have increased confidence because I'm actually hitting my goals. It feels good to be to, to tell yourself the truth. You know, it's, it's important to not to lie to other people, but I say it's actually important not to lie to yourself. The most important person that's, uh, that, uh, that you need to keep your promises to is you. So if you keep saying, I'm going to exercise one day and you never do, you're just, you, you understand, well, I'm just lying to myself, right? So when you, when you actually keep your word to yourself, you develop increased confidence. And because you have more confidence, you have higher productivity, again, increased mood. All of these things create these dominoes that start to fall over just because you chose to exercise, okay? So that is a keystone habit. So that's one thing I absolutely recommend. If you're not doing anything else, start exercising. When you start exercising, it starts knocking over all of these other dominoes, okay? So that's a keystone habit. Now, here, I'm gonna show you another keystone habit in a few minutes on reading food labels. We're gonna go more into that. But here's why the science of this works, okay? So it takes anywhere from 21 days to 200 days to build a habit, anywhere from 21 to 200 days to build a habit. And that depends on the amount of what's called limbic friction, okay? Limbic friction right here, and this is coined by um, Andrew Huberman. He has a great podcast. If you ever want to go listen to how to develop habits, I'm getting a lot of this from him on these next couple of slides. He's a neuroscientist that teaches at Stanford. Andrew Huberman is his name. Um, he has a, an, a podcast called The Huberman Lab. Um, so he talks about limbic friction and limbic friction is the strain or effort it takes to overcome lack of motivation or anxiety or anxiousness to do something. Okay. So when you think about, I want to go start exercising, you have something called limbic friction because that part of your brain has not been wired enough yet to form a habit. When you form a habit, here's how a habit happens. These neurons talk to these neurons, talk to these neurons, talk to these neurons. And when you, when you fire these pathways enough, you can create a powerful, it's called neuroplasticity. You create these pathways to where, oh, I just exercise. It becomes very easy. There's no limbic friction because that's just what you do. But at the beginning, there's going to be limbic friction because all these little arrows don't exist yet. These neurons are just sitting out here. You need to consciously fire this one to then 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 fire this one. That's the way that works. But that, so that's called limbic friction is the, is the firing of these things at first to overcome the friction that's keeping you stuck, right? So what that looks like is um, I don't want to exercise. I want to start exercising, right? But what would limbic friction look like? Well, I got to go buy shoes. And I don't, man, I don't want to buy shoes because I, last time I went to that store, they didn't have the shoes or there was a high pressure salesperson there. I don't want to go do that. Um, and then I got to join the gym. But then if I join the gym, I got to, I got to, make sure that my credit card is, is cleared off. And I mean, I don't want to do that right now. I need to pay this off first. Um, I, I, I want to really want to go to the gym, but then it's going to, it's going to be winter soon and it's going to be cold and I don't like to be outside in shorts. And then if I want to wear, you know, I don't want to wear shorts. I got to get pants to wear in there. And that's a pant. It's just all of this stuff that we tell ourselves you haven't created this habit yet. So a hack that you can, that you can use is what's called procedural memory. Okay, so using procedural memory, which is firing these, these neuronal pathways, performing the mental exercise of thinking through the steps first required to, uh, uh, the thing that's going to create that habit from start to finish, that will has been shown in studies to improve your likelihood of performing that habit and decrease limbic friction. Okay, 
So by visualizing it, if you really visualize it, you can see you, your brain will start to think that's happening and it will start to fire these neurons and start to correct these or connect these neurons right here without you even doing it yet. So you can actually increase your, your, your likelihood of following through with the, the thing that it creates to habit by visualizing. Okay, so I want to show you something that you can do if you're struggling with this with eating well, with exercising, anything else. Here's how you do this visualization. So the, here's the procedural memory hack. So you sit down and you visualize all of the things that are going to create limbic friction. And you visualize yourself overcoming those things. And by doing that, you're creating these pathways in your brain that says, hey, it's going to be cold, but that's okay. If it's cold, I'll just preheat, I'll just get the car warmed up in the garage. And then you're, you're thinking, well, that's going to be... Um, that's going to be hard to get on the treadmill um, because there's too many people on the treadmill at this time. Oh, that's okay. If there's too many people on the treadmill, I'm just going to go do the elliptical machine instead, right? So the things that I do at the gym, I don't even think about them, right? Because they're habits. So you can actually visualize things, these things first. So what you do is you sit and visualize. So let's say you want to, you're going to start this eating plan, right? So you're going to do the, the 20 and 30 or the, the new year, new year challenge. So you're going to sit and visualize yourself driving to the store. Right? Maybe you're going to do this this week. I got to go to the store and I got to get all this food. So I got to drive to the store, which means, yeah, it's cold out right now. It's really cold. So I'll probably need to, I'm, I'm going to visualize myself, you know, uh, heating the car up, you know, so getting the car running for a couple of minutes. So it's not too cold. Um, I'm going to get my favorite winter hat and put that on. Um, and then you're going to, you got to go in the grocery store. So in order to do that, I visualize myself literally walking in the store, even though it's raining or it's snowing. Um, and then I have to shop, right? So I got to, I got to deal with that squeaky wheel on the on the the, the grocery buggy. Um, I and and I gotta I gotta figure this out. Dr. Eric has this list of stuff I gotta get. So you visualize yourself. Oh, here's the zucchini. Oh, here's that almond milk, the unsweetened almond milk that he was talking about. Um, you visualize yourself walking past the Oreos, like literally visualize yourself seeing those Oreos and going, you know, what? I don't need those, and I walk right past it. Now again, you can do this while you're vi while you're sitting there with your eyes closed because there's nothing at stake, right? This is just a this is just an exercise in visualization. So I can visualize myself actually succeeding and walking past those Oreos. Um, then I got to unload the groceries when I get home. So I can visualize, you know, maybe I'll put some music on so it's a little bit more fun, or maybe I'll put the TV on and you know watch a show that I like while I'm while I'm um, unloading these groceries. I got to prep the meals. So I got to put them away in the right place. I got to maybe wash the lettuce or cut up some of the vegetables. So I visualize myself doing that. Then I got to visualize myself eating and then cleaning up and doing those things. Now, if you don't visualize yourself first, you can still overcome this, but it takes a lot more because there's a lot more limbic friction. You can, you can kind of grease the skids there and reduce the friction by visualizing this before. You do, if they say, the, the studies show that if you do this one time, you're like 40% more likely to do the act, to actually establish the habit. And they've actually done studies on, on this looking at like people shooting free throws, basketball free throws, whereas people would visualize an hour a day, they would just visualize their form and visualize making the baskets. And they had people actually practicing it. And the people that practice it versus visualized it, there was almost no change in their, in their improved success for shooting free throws. So it's not the actual muscle work that it was. It was the mental work because the mental work is what's controlling everything else. And if you have to do that every day, then do it every day. Get up and visualize your day. Visualize um, going to the gym. Visualize what it feels like. So that's the next part. When you want, when you get a a positive uh, feedback, you get some a, a dopamine release. Okay, this is the why. Pe this is why people scroll through their phones. This is why people succeed at things because that you get a dopamine response, and that dopamine response makes your brain feel good right? That's why it feels good to go to the gym because you get a dopamine response and your body's like, oh, I feel good. I actually accomplished something. This is awesome. Um, so a dopamine reward hack with visualization is visualize how good it's going to feel. Visualize how good it's going to feel to lose the weight, to be able to you know, lose that 20 pounds that you wanted to. What's that going to feel like? Visualize how it feels like to not be addicted to food um, or be less addicted to food. Um, visualize what it feels like to digest food better and go to bed feeling better, to sleep better, to wake up more energized you will release dopamine by doing that, okay? So visualization can be used before you do something to actually overcome limbic friction. So procedural memory, look at the procedure that it's gonna take and visualize the procedures and then also visualize the outcomes. And if you do those consistently, so what I'd recommend is that you get up in the morning and you visualize, you do the procedural memory visualization first, take three or four minutes and then do the dopamine reward, which is visualize how good it's gonna feel and what the reward's gonna feel like when you actually succeed this. 
And that's what gets your brain working for you. It's called the reticular activating system. When you can program that thing working for you, good things are going to happen. You're going to start to see opportunities in places. You're going to start to overcome challenges. You're going to start to see areas that make things easier in your life. And you're going to start to recognize those, those opportunities a lot more. So that's how you overcome limbic friction. The other way you overcome limbic friction is you just do it. Okay. So it doesn't mean you have to like exercising. I used to, I used to like riding my bike a lot. I don't ride my bike much anymore because I figured it wasn't as good for me as I was riding 10 hours a week. It wasn't good for my back. It wasn't good for my elbow. Um, it wasn't good for some other things, you know, with like cortisol release and things like that, but I enjoyed it. So I really like riding my bike. Now I don't really ride my bike. I play golf instead. That's not enough exercise. So I still need to go do my cardio and all of that. I do not enjoy that at all. <laughs> I, I don't, but I don't have to because I've overcome limbic friction. I've said, you know what? I'm not going to enjoy this. I don't hate it, you know, but I don't enjoy it that much. So you know what? I'm going to go do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. And because I did that, how do you get rid of friction on a sand, on sandpaper? You use it. The more you use that sandpaper, the less friction you have. So if you just do it anyway, right? If you just if you bootstrap it and say, you know, what? I'm going to the gym, even if I don't like it, then that's the way this works. Okay. So you, that's the two ways that you can overcome limbic friction. Now, here's the other keystone habit. And this is, this is reading food labels. So here's why keystone habits is, is, a, is the same as exercise. When you start reading food labels, that's going to train you to make better food choices. That's going to train you to probably Google some things, right? Get on your phone and Google some things. And by doing that, you're going to learn to make new neuronal connections. Um, you're probably going to tell other people about that. If you see them eating something, you might say, hey, did you know this was in there? So it's going to spur all these other habits that are going to be healthy for you. They're going to make you more successful. So the keystone habit of reading food labels, I'm just going to go through the basic framework here. The first is the less ingredients, the better. So if we can get you reading food labels, I guarantee you're going to start getting this to where this works long term because you'll become a master of this. So first the rule is less ingredients, the better. Okay, that's the easy one. So if you pick up two peanut butters and this one has less ingredients, nine times out of 10, that's going to be better for you. Okay, but there's a few more. So we want to look at, and this is my framework because you can read, there's a million different things you can read on food labels, but here's the framework that's going to get it right for you 99% of the time. I want you to look at sugar and serving size. I want you to look at the type of fats that are in there. And I want you to look at toxins. So we're going to talk about sugar, fats, and toxins. Those are the three things that I'm looking for. Sugars, fats, and toxins. You're going to look for a certain, the less sugar, the better. And then how many serving size are, is in there? That's important because let's say I want you to just have less than 10 grams of sugar per serving. And that's a that's pretty good. 10 grams of added sugar. It depends if you're eating 50 of those a day, that wouldn't be good. But if you're going to eat like a, a kind bar or something like that, you would want less than 10 grams of added sugar per serving size, 10 grams of sugar per serving size or less. So if, if I have a kind bar and I look and it says it has um, seven grams or five grams of sugar, but there's nine servings in that bar. Obviously, that's way more than five grams. This could be 45 grams, right? So you got to look at serving size, especially with drinks. A lot of times you'll get like an iced tea and you look at the bottle and it says two and a half servings, right? So it'll say 10 grams per serving. But if you drink the whole bottle, it's 25 grams of sugar because it's two and a half times that. So we're going to look at sugar first because sugar causes disease. We're going to look at fats. We're going to look at toxins, okay? So why are we looking at sugar? Why? Well, sugar is the primary cause of obesity. Sugar increases the acidity of your body. Every disease exists in an acidic environment and is fostered by acidic environment. Sugar causes inflammation, which we talked about at the New Year, New You challenge. Sugar is the primary reason for high cholesterol. It's not cholesterol in your food. It's sugar that stimulates your liver to produce high cholesterol. Sugar causes hormonal imbalances, including leptin and estrogen and insulin, the ones that we talked about the other day. That's what causes those imbalances. Um, sugar causes diabetes, sugar causes heart disease, sugar is an anti-nutrient, which means it robs nutrients from other, your other parts of your body. So if you drink a Coke while you're eating an apple, your body has to take the nutrients from the apple to offset the damage from the Coca-Cola. Um, and sugar promotes cancer, sugar feeds cancer. We have to avoid sugar. That's the primary thing that I want you doing is reducing the amount of sugar that you're putting in your body. So let's take a look here. So, bre so beverages, how do we, how do we read these food labels? So First of all, remember sugar and serving size. So how many servings are in this? Serving size is one can, okay? So I know whatever's in this can, that's what I'm looking at. How many grams of sugar? 39 grams of sugar. You're not supposed to get more than 25 a day. And this is 35 in one 12 ounce Coke. There's just no reason in the world to be doing that. So that's number one. 
Um, number two is we're going to look at fats. Well, there's no fat in there, so you don't have to worry about that. Toxins. Well, the toxins are going to be anything with like a hashtag or a dollar sign. And then, but the other one would be high fructose corn syrup, which is a toxin. You want to be avoiding that. So what would be some better choices that you can make? Okay. What would be the best choices that you can make there? Um, I got one second here. Somebody is unmuted. I'll make sure that's handled. One sec, guys. Let me was wrong. Okay. I think I got it. Okay, we're back to it. Um, so back to sugar and serving size again. So we got 39 grams of sugar. So a better option would be this like blue sky soda. All right, if you have to have soda because it's made with real sugar. Um, so at least it doesn't have high fructose corn syrup. So that's, that's less toxic, but how many grams of sugar? We're still 43 grams of sugar. So almost the same as a Coke. So that's not gonna be a good one either. Now it's better than that, but that's still not what I want you drinking. So instead of that, if you still need something sweet, instead of drinking that, you can drink something like vitamin water zero. So if we look at sugar and serving size, serving size, one bottle, sugars, zero. Now, if it's got zero grams of sugar, I want to look at what's it, what it's sweetened with, right? And what it's typically going to be sweetened with over here, stevia leaf extract. See that? Stevia leaf. That's where you're getting the actual sweetener from, stevia, okay? Um, it also has erythritol, which is like xylitol. So if you know the sweeteners that are good are going to be monk fruit, stevia, erythritol, are the one, and xylitol are the ones I want you using. Now, if this said zero grams of sugar, but it said aspartame up here, what's that going to violate? Toxins. Aspartame is an artificial sweetener. That is a potent neurotoxin. So you would want to put that back. So but this vitamin water zero is sweetened with stevia and erythritol. So that's good. Or if you really feel like you need the bubbly soda and the soda flavor, this is Zevia, okay? Zevia soda, Z-E-V-I-A. And it's Zevia because it's sweetened with Stevia, okay? So again, one serving size, zero grams of sugar, sweetened with Stevia. My wife drinks this on a fairly regular basis because she likes cola, but she's not getting the 39 grams of sugar that are causing all of this that I talked about back here, okay? Now, fats. So this is, this is hummus. So this is a good example of this. So this is Yasmin uh, Mediterranean hummus, the original version. I'm going to put that, I'm going to turn that over on the back. Now, what should be in hummus is going to be garbanzo beans or chickpeas, olive oil. Remember, those are the good fats. Olive oil, avocado oil are going to be the best fats. Um, and then usually like sesame tahini is what's going to be in there. Okay. So what do we have? Garbanzo beans, tahini, which is sesame seeds. And then what do we have? Olive oil. And it's got lemon juice, garlic, sea salt, and spices. So this is great right? This is almost like you're making it yourself, which you can make yourself, you can make your own hummus really easily. It's super simple. Um, but this has olive oil. Now, if you grab the Sabra hummus, which is right next to it, or that's at like the Starbucks or something, what you're going to read that is going to say garbanzo beans, tahini. And again, you're going to look for fats, right? That's number two, sugar, fats, toxins. And this is going to say canola oil. You want to put that back because canola oil is a rancid fat that causes inflammation that's really bad for you right? So that's what you want to look for fats. Now, fats are also going to be in pretty much any cracker or cookie or pretty much anything that's in a box is going to have some type of fat. And you want that fat to say coconut oil, olive oil, or, um, or avocado oil. You don't want it to say canola oil, vegetable oil, corn oil, or anything like that. Okay. And then the third one is going to be toxins. So let's say we go, okay, sugar. Yeah, it's low in sugar. Good. Fats. Yeah, it's got the right type of fat. Now, are there any toxins? Let me keep reading this. Nope, no toxins there. So I'm good, right? If I go back up to here, um, any toxins in here? Uh, nope, 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 nope. Those are just vitamins, right? So we're good to go there. Any any bad stuff in there? Nope, 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 nope. So we're not seeing any, how do we determine if there's toxins? Does it have any dollar signs in it or artificial sweeteners? The artificial sweeteners you want, you just want to, you need to learn these. This is going to be, um, Aspartame, A-S-P-A-R-T-A-M-E, aspartame, um, sucralose, which is stevia, or not stevia, um, sucralose, which is Splenda, that's the yellow packet, sucralose, S-U-C-R-A-L-O-S-E, sucralose, and then saccharin, there's not, saccharin is not in very many things anymore, but sucralose is the one that's probably in the most things, and then aspartame. Those two things, you want to avoid those things like the, the plague because they are brain poisons. You don't ever want to give those to your kids. You don't ever want to eat those yourself. There's very few things that I'll say I'll never eat. That is one of them. Um, I was on an airplane this weekend and my buddy offered me a mint. And I was like, man, my breath has to be terrible. I've had enough water today. 
He's like, you want a mint? I'm like, no, absolutely. I don't want a mint because it's got brain poison in it. That type, it was like the, forgot what it was. It was like the Arctic blast, you know, regular mint. Um, and it had aspartame in it as the sweetener. So I'm like, no, I'll deal with the bad breath until I can brush my teeth. Um, so I, the, I'm going to avoid those, uh, those artificial sweeteners at all costs. Now, usually those artificials are going to be anything that says diet. It's going to be lab labeled diet or no sugar. Okay. Diet or no sugar. So if we go back to this for a second, if this said um, vitamin water zero, but it had aspartame in it, it's going to be good on the sugar front. It's going to be good on the fat front. It's not going to be good on the toxin front. So I'm going to put that back. Okay. So here we'll look at, and then the other thing is anything with a dollar sign. Okay. So anything red number, whatever, yeah, red number, blue number. So if we're, this is Skittles. So what people feed our kids and we wonder why we have so much uh, ADD and, and issues like that. So so the first thing in there, let's look at this. So we're going to look at sugar first. So serving size. All right. So in that bag, there's three <laughs> servings per bag. So how many uh, grams of uh, sugar in there? 29 grams of sugar. If you eat a third of the bag, but you're not going to eat a third of the bag. You're going to eat the whole bag, which is going to be how many grams of sugar? 90 grams of sugar. Okay. We're talking about 90 grams of sugar here. Now, why is that an issue? 90 grams of sugar is four times as much as you should have in a normal day, which causes all of the diseases that I just talked about. So we're looking at sugar, sugar and serving size. So that's one reason you would put it back. Fats. Are there any fats in there? Yeah, there's going to be fats. Hydrogenated palm kernel oil. Junky, junky fat. Anything that says hydrogenated is going to be a bad fat. So a lot of times it'll say hydrogenated palm kernel oil. That's a bad trans fat, right? So the good fats are going to be coconut oil, olive oil, avocado oil. Those are going to be good oils. Um, and then what do we have down here? We have red number 40. We have blue number one, red number 40, blue number two, blue number one, yellow number five. All of those th things have been linked to, uh, to ADHD in kids. They've been linked to brain tumors in certain kids. They've been linked to childhood cancer, leukemia, all right? These things were never meant to be put on our bodies. It was never created through nature. So if you just get used to reading those, if you, so if you can do that, read, I'm reading sugar, serving size, and then I'm reading fats and then I'm reading toxins. If you just get those, you're going to be good 99% of the time. So let's take a look at another one. So this is a Cliff Bar, okay? So Cliff Bar, is a Cliff Bar good for you? Well, let's take a look at it. Um, so organic, organic brown rice syrup. Actually, let's go to sugars first. So serving size is one bar. Okay, so if you eat the one bar, this is how many grams of sugar you're going to get. 22 grams of sugar, which is, again, how much you should get in an entire day. No reason to eat a Cliff Bar. The only reason you would ever eat a Cliff Bar, I would ever eat one. I wouldn't eat these anyway because of this other stuff that's in there. But if you were going to work out really hard and you're eating a Cliff Bar like during your workout or right after your workout or right before the workout, if you're going to go burn that sugar, that's one thing. I'm talking about a hard workout. I'm talking about an hour and a half of really high intensity exercise. Then you need that. You do not need to fuel an exercise that's that's a half hour or less. You just don't need to. You can do surge training. You can do 30 minutes on the bike on an empty stomach. If you have to eat something, eat some berries or something like that. You do not need to fuel an exercise unless it's an intense exercise, like an hour, hour and a half of really intense exercise. So if I'm going on a two hour hardcore bike ride or I'm going to play a basketball game, something like that, that's where you might eat something like this. But the reason I'm not going to pick this one is then we're going to go look at fats, okay? So what fats would be in here? Let's keep reading until we see fats. Do we see any? Do we see any organic oat flour, organic sunflower? Here we go. Organic sunflower oil. Sunflower oil is a rancid, junky fat. Okay. The reason they put it in there is because it's cheaper. But if that said organic coconut oil, I'd be like, cool. These people know what they're doing. This is an actual health food. But it's not. Organic sunflower oil. Sunflower oil and safflower oils are rancid vegetable oils. They're not good for you. Um, and then the last one here, um, so toxins, I don't see any artificial colors or anything in there, which is good, but I do see, I'm always going to look at anything that has protein, any bar, I'm going to look at what type of protein source they have. And it says, um, soy protein isolate. Okay. Soy protein isolate messes up your hormones. It's again, junky protein that you don't want to put into your body. It causes hormone imbalances. If that said whey protein or pea protein or egg protein or something, I might be okay with it. But that's another reason I wouldn't eat a cliff bar. So instead of a cliff bar, I would rather have like a kind bar. I don't have a kind bar up in front of me, but even that, that's going to be five grams of sugar. And it, it, But if you have the kind bar that has protein, right? So if it says kind bar with uh, 10 grams of protein added, I'm going to go look at what type of protein and guess what the protein is going to be. It's, it's going to be soy protein isolate because it's cheap. 
So it doesn't mean because it says kind, it's good for you. You got to read the food label. Some of the kind bars, okay. Some of them aren't same thing with like zone bars or um, any of those other bars, you know, primal kitchen makes a, makes a good one. Primal nutrition, they make a good one, but you got to read those food labels. Okay. Um, all right. This is, this is a, a fun, fun thing to talk about is vacation meals. Okay. So this is one thing that I use to stay successful long-term. So after the 30 days, okay. So this would be implemented after you reach your health goals, right? So after doing this for 30 days, if you've reached your weight loss goal, then we can start talking about vacation meals. If your blood sugar is now under control, your A1C is normal and your blood sugar is, you know, down in, you know, 85 or 87 when you take a blood test, good. Um, if your blood sugar pressure is normalized, whatever it is that was your goal, right? If that's happened, then we can start to look at some vacation meals. If it hasn't happened, what do you need to do? The same thing that's getting you healed, right? So that's why we call it, again, the healing of the advanced healing diet. So how do you, how long do you do this until you're healed? And I was still recommending eating a lot like that, but you can have vacation meals. Once you hit those things, we can look at vacation meals, okay? This is The Rock. So The Rock is like the most ripped human being on planet earth. And he puts on his Instagram all the time his vacation meal. So where he was like training for the movie Black Adam, and he, he was, I was following him and he said he, he would eat like three pizzas on his cheat days, he calls them. He would eat like three pizzas. He would eat 20 pancakes. He would eat like five plates of sushi or whatever. It's kind of crazy. Um, but the rest of the days he was really good. And he planned these cheat days um, or planned these, I call them vacation meals because it's not really cheating if you're planning it. And everybody knows it's gonna happen anyway. You're not cheating. Um, you, like I give myself permission to do it. It's like taking a vacation. I do things on vacation that I don't do the rest of the time, right? So on vacation, you can have some of these vacation meals and he is incredibly ripped and has, you know, four, you know, whatever, six, 7% body fat, looks great, healthier than he's ever been. And he still does these cheat meals. So for me, this is what I do. I want to be good. At, I want to be at least 90% good on my eating, right? So um, if I eat 35 times a week, so I typically eat five times a day, I do breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. Sometimes I'll skip breakfast or dinner for intermittent fasting purposes, but typically um, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. I'm eating quite a bit. So I do breakfast in the morning, a small breakfast. I'll do some type of snack in the mid morning, typically like a handful of nuts or a Granny Smith apple, something like that. And then I'll eat my lunch and then I'll do something in the afternoon, like maybe a paleo cookie that I made from paleo grubs. Or I'll do like some celery and almond butter or, you know, something like carrots with, um, with hummus, or I'll do like nut thins and hummus. That'll be a good afternoon snack. And then I do dinner. So if I, that time seven is 35. So if I do that, 90% of good is going to be what around 32. So I can do three vacation meals a week, still stay in the healthy range that I want to be in. And I won't feel deprived. The key to vacation meals is you don't ever want to say, you know what, I'm never going to eat a piece of cheesecake again. I'm never going to eat pizza again. I will tell you, if life without pizza for me would not be very happy. Now I can eat healthier pizza. I can eat cauliflower crust pizza, which is great. And I eat that on a pretty regular basis. I get the, the frozen cauliflower crust and we'll make our own pizza at home. Um, you can get cauliflower power frozen pizzas at the store, which I'll eat those occasionally. But I would be sad if I could never go to Lubo's pizza and eat that again, right? So um, I, I'm gonna do that about three times a week, all right? So I plan my vacation meals in here and that's what's key. Treat them like any other vacation. They need to be planned. If you went into your, your office and said, you know what? I'm taking all my week's vacation. I'm taking my two weeks vacation today. See ya. You'd get fired. You got to plan your vacations, right? So I plan my vacation meal. So when I look at what I'm going to do, like for instance, this week, um, I'm going to be going out of town. I'm going to be doing some, some flying this weekend. And I know like Sunday is going to be a vacation meal for sure. Um, so I'm going to be out of town. I know I'm not going to be able to find something healthy where I'm going. I'm going to do a vacation meal and I'm not going to worry about it, but then I'll, I'll get a clean meal, like a salad or something for, for dinner. So that'll be one vacation meal for me. I might use two vacation meals on that trip, but that's, you know, typically the way I'll look at it. If I'm not going out of town, I'll usually do a vacation meal like Wednesday night. Cause I could do really well Monday, Tuesday and keep that motivation up. Look forward to having whatever I want to eat on that, that vacation meal on a Wednesday night. I'll be good on uh, Thursday. Cause I just, you know, I just got to eat what I wanted. I'm back on the wagon on Thursday. And then, Friday, Saturday, maybe my wife and I are going out Saturday or Friday night, vacation meal. Maybe my daughter wants to go to brunch with me on Sunday, vacation meal, okay? But the rest of the time, I'm eating according to the meal plans that I laid out for you. So I'm avoiding all of that stuff that's making me sick, okay? So that's what that 30-day program looks like and kind of coming off of the 30-day program or however long it takes you to hit your goals, that's when you can start adding in vacation meals. Now, the question I've been getting a lot here is what's your optimal lifestyle, lifestyle eating style? Like, am I going to eat this way the rest of my life? What's the best way for me to eat? Okay. So I always say when you're trying to figure out the best way for you to eat, everyone is different. 
Okay, the 30 day that we that we gave you there, that is very effective at fixing the five factors that we talked about. So if you're overweight, that is a, the 30 day meal plan, the new year, new year meal plan works amazingly well. If you have high blood pressure, it works amazingly well. If you if you have high uh, blood sugar or diabetes, it works amazingly well. If you have high cholesterol or blood lipids, that works great. And if you have autoimmune disease, that is a great way to eat. One of the main reasons I largely eat that way is because I do have an autoimmune. I have autoimmune expression in my body called psoriatic arthritis. I have psoriasis and I've had a psoriatic arthritis flare up that I don't ever want again. Part of it's genetic. I get it very rarely. And, but I do have that gene that expresses itself sometimes, right? But the more I eat junky food, the more the psoriasis expresses itself, the more those flare-ups would express themselves. So I want to make sure I'm eating the right thing that cooperates with my body, right? But once those five factors are corrected, everybody's different, right? So everybody, there's, there's people that do different, better on different types of food. So I did a food sensitivity test, and I'll, I'll show you more about this in a minute. But um, and I'll show you how you determine what you should be eating long term. So I did a food sensitivity test and it told me my food sensitivities. OK, and it told me a couple of other things. So this is one that we've been doing for our patients a lot in the office. We've had some great results with it. I've done it with my family for a while. So if you take a look at this, food sensitivities are things that my body doesn't do well with. OK, so these things cause inflammation in my body. Now, my wife's right next to mine doesn't look like mine at all. She can do really well with these gluten-containing cereals and grains. It doesn't cause this massive inflammation in her body because everybody's genetically different. It's not exactly the same for everyone. So because she can eat those things and I can't, our diet doesn't look exactly the same, okay, long-term. Now, we might do some of the same things. A lot, like we avoid sugar and we don't eat bad fats, but like there's different things that I, I can do long-term that she can't. So for me, gluten is a problem, okay? So brown bread is highly reactive. Red is highly reactive. Orange is mildly reactive. Um, green is good. So bread, um, rye bread, white bread, wheat bread, um, camet, wheat noodles, rye, spelt, wheat. All of those things are highly reactive, which means they cause inflammation in me. I don't need any more inflammation in my body. Um, so gluten-free cereals and grains. Let's say if I could do like, I'll just be gluten-free. Well, it's not the gluten that's the problem. It's the grains that are the problem, okay? My body does not do well with grains. So like maybe I'll do just corn tortillas instead. Nope, corn tortilla is highly reactive. Maybe I'll do corn flakes because they're gluten-free. Nope, highly reactive. Garbanzo bean flour, nope, not good. Sorghum, not good. Taco shells, not good. Almond flour, not good. Now, a lot of what I would eat on a normal paleo diet would be like almond flour, but instead of, but my body doesn't do well with almond flour. So instead of almond flour, I'll do like oat flour or, or something else because I do okay with oats. Okay. So oats are okay. So it's a simple straight. I'm like, you know what? Instead of using almond flour and those cookies I like so much, I'll do oat flour because my body does okay with oats and I do well with that. Um, and then the other thing I'm looking at is cheese. I don't do well with any cheese and very little dairy. Okay. Um, eggs I'm okay with butter I'm kind of middle with. So I, I try to do, I do um, ghee instead, clarified butter, because it doesn't have the, the dairy fats or, or dairy proteins that are in there. Um, I don't do well with cream, right? I don't, ice cream's not good. Yogurt's not typically very good for me. Um, eggs I'm okay with. Um, beer, not good, probably because of the grains. Um, lager, again, beer, not good because of that. Um, bananas aren't, aren't my, and part of it, because I was overusing bananas for a while, my body probably developed a sensitivity to it. But if we go back to these again, this gives me an idea of what I should be eating. So if I strip out grains and I strip out most dairy, that's called a paleo diet. So what's going to be best for me? Paleo diet. That's the best thing for me. Eating paleo is going to be the best thing for me. And that's how I feel best. Okay. Now, my daughter, different. Hers is not paleo. Hers is gluten-free. She has a lot of problems with gluten, but she can do a lot of these gluten-free alternatives. She can do gluten-free bread. She can do corn tortillas. She can do those things and feel fine. So do you see how you start customizing this yourself so you know what you actually need to eat? Because the other part of this is if you're like, oh, I thought, but I thought yogurt was good for me. No, it's not good for everybody, right? So if I think yogurt's good for me and I'm eating the yogurt every day and I think these almond flour cookies are good for me and I, and I think, um, oh, I heard Ezekiel bread is good for me. Well, it's still wheat, right? So I'm eating those things. I'm like, why do I still feel like crap? Why do I, why is my stomach still hurt? Why does my, why are my fingers swollen? Why do I not sleep well? Why is my energy not good? Why do I have this brain fog? Why is my digestion a mess? It's because I'm eating things that aren't ideal for me. Now, what is really good for me? Fruits, and I don't have all of my whole thing here. Fruits are really good. Vegetables are really good. Lean proteins are really good. That's paleo, right? Most nuts are really good. That's a paleo diet. So I know that's something that I should be doing. Um, 
But the other thing the test actually looks like, this is a hair test, contrary to popular belief. I do have hair on my arm, so that's how I did this. Um, so the hair test also showed, it looks at what I'm deficient in other nutrients. Now, this is why, again, why this is really important. What supplements do I need to take? Well, um, I'm deficient in betaine, which is a stomach enzyme. So I'm not digesting my food unless I take betaine. So I take that when I eat. But the other one, if you're at Saturday, molybdenum, right? So I'm deficient in molybdenum. What's, if you remember me talking about detox, molybdenum is the main detoxifier in your body. It's a cofactor for detoxification and, and glutathione production. So I need molybdenum. So I'm taking the, the, the detox antioxidants that I had at the office. I take that every day because I'm deficient in molybdenum, right? So where can I get magnesium? I can get magnesium from more spinach. I can take a magnesium supplement if I need to. Phosphorus, where can I get that? You can get that from a lot of different places in your diet. So I can start looking, okay, what are the th foods that I have that are going to raise those, right? Now I'm good with all these, but those needed help. So that's how I can dial in the supplements that I need to do and what I need to do and that I don't need to do. And then the foods that I need to eat and the things that work for me. Okay. Now, if, if somebody over here was really good with this, really good with this, but they didn't do really well with protein, like maybe they had issues with with turkey and chicken and beef and all of those things. Well, that person would probably need to be more like vegetarian or vegan or plant-based, right? So you can really tell based on these, these, um, these profiles. Now, here's another example. This is my mom. Um, my mom had psoriatic arthritis her whole life and was taking Humira, which is a horrible, expensive medication because she had these like crippling psoriatic or arthritis flare-ups. So we did the test on her and the comprehensive uh, metabolic test, it, and this is what it tests. It tests your your food sensitivities, heavy metal sensitivities, it tests your vitamin A through K, it tests um, issues with any additives or food additives that are in your body. It looks at your gut analysis. So it looks at how your what kind of gut bacteria you have and do you have any overgrowth of bacteria. It looks at your digestion, um, all of those things. And when we did testing on her, what we found here is that she had severe reactions to these certain food additives. So we looked those things up and she was trying to avoid those when she was here. Now she did, and she did better with the psoriatic arthritis, but she moved to Portugal recently. And guess what? Lo and behold, they don't put these things in the food over there. They don't, they don't put these additives, right? These sodium, like there's there, one of them is, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the one, the, the big one for her. It was, oh, it's a magnesium stearate, which is a preservative. So I think that's E22, 220. So she didn't, they don't put that in the food over there. So guess what's happened to her, her psoriatic arthritis? It's gone. She's lived over there for over a year. She hasn't had one flare up. She was getting one flare up a month before. So again, when you know the things that you need to be avoiding, you're going to be in a much better place. So that's how you can tell what you need to do long term. Okay. And fortunately, it's not terribly expensive. It's a, it's a hair test. Uh, we clip the hair, we send it off, get the results back in about 10 days. So what we started putting together is the Axiom Customized Nutrition Program. And we've been doing this for since November now. This is Tony. Uh, Tony is a certified nutrition coach and, and health practitioner. She is amazing at this. And what we do is we start with the, the comprehensive sensitivity test. So normally the cost is $89. Anyone who wants to do that tonight, we I talked to her, her earlier about that and said we would do that for $69, so a $20 savings. And then what that it tells you that whole comprehensive all of these so it tests all of this to, and then it's a literally a 64 page printout and then what we do is we do a consultation and we highlight the most impactful results so you don't have to look at every little thing on there look at the two or three they're going to move the needle the most and then we would outline whatever customized nutrition program according to your goals and your challenges so so this is the important part it's not just hey eat this way this is consultations with a coach that's going to show you hey Here's how you overcome that. Maybe you have an emotional eating challenge. Um, maybe you have a hard time with time, or maybe you don't like these four foods that you're supposed to eat, or maybe you have a hard time with recipes. That's what she supports you with. And I feel like this is a long time coming because a lot of people, you can't just give them a book and they're off and running. Um, Tony has had amazing feedback just with the 15 or 20 people she's worked with so far. We've seen people overcome um, severe, severe IBS. We've seen people lose weight. We've seen people's blood sugar and blood pressure normalize. Um, but the biggest thing that I, I'm, I'm getting great feedback on is like, they're like, I'm finally figuring this out. Like I'm finally figuring out how I can do this the rest of my life. Cause I'm learning these skills and I have the support from you to do this. So if you want to do that test, um, you can text Tony. She said, I could give out her number. So you would text her at this number down here, 949-394-0907. So again, 949-394-0907 and just say, hey, give her your name and hey, I'm interested in doing the test. 
and you're not signing up for anything, she'll call and do a 15 minute consultation with you, tell you what it's all about, tell you what the program is. Um, but really, and then if you want to do the test, then you can do that test for $69. Okay. And if you decide to do any, you know, follow up from there, that 69 gets credited towards any program that you do. But the, the main thing is getting the test done. All right. So if you get the test done, you can have an idea of what you need to do and what specifically works for you. So again, uh, normally $89, we're doing that for $69 and she'll program, make sure she puts your program or, or shows you your program and what you are sensitive to, what you're not, what you're lacking in, what you're deficient in, what your gut looks like and gives you steps to healing those things so you can optimize your nutrition for yourself. All right, so make sure you text her if you wanna do that uh, at this number right down here. Um, and again, we have room for 10 because we have quite a few people doing the program now, but she said she could make space for 10 more people. All right. And that includes anybody in your family, anybody around you that needs help. Um, we, you don't have to be, all we need to do is get the hair sample, but then we can do a lot of this remotely as well. So uh, we've been doing some work with people that even don't even live here. So, all right. Um, and then the last thing is just questions. So I wanted to open up for some questions for you. So if you go over to the chat button, um, you can just type questions in the chat and I'll be able to answer those as we go. So on your little, uh, your little dashboard in the chat, you can uh, fire a question off. So if anybody wants to type something in the chat, I'll just make sure that's working. Um, so I'll type one in here. So that went out to everybody. So if you have a question, you can just type that in the chat and I'll do my best to answer it. We got about five, six minutes left. Any questions from anybody? Cool. Yep. Uh, Patty says she just texted Tony. So awesome. Um, what about protein per day? I understand it should be about one gram of per pound of body weight. Um, that's actually a lot. Um, that's a lot of protein. So if you're trying to, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to build a bunch of muscle, you might want to be doing like for me, I weigh about 180 pounds, 180 grams of protein is a lot. Um, so I would say probably half of that for most people. Um, unless you're trying to do something like build a lot of muscle or and you're working out really hard and you're trying to rebuild that, um, I would say about that, that hundred grams uh, would be pretty good there. And again, unless you're trying to build a lot of muscle. Carbs per day. That's, I, I do want to go ahead and answer that too. And, and I'll usually get a question about that. So carbohydrates a day, I was just talking to some buddies on, on the trip I was on this weekend and my friend said, I'm, I'm trying to keep my total carbohydrates or net carbohydrates under about 120 a day. Is that good? Because he's trying to get his blood sugar under control and lose some weight. I'm like, yeah, that's excellent. The average person gets about 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. So if you're eating a ton of carbohydrates every day, you're getting a lot of insulin. You're getting a lot of blood sugar release. You're messing up your leptin levels. So watching your net carbs or total carbs, eating things lower in net carbs is typically going to be a good way to eat as well. And then when you are eating protein like that, so if you're eating quite a bit of protein, so if you're eating you know, up to, um, you know, one gram per, per pound of body weight or, you know, less than that. So anywhere up to that. So if I'm getting a hundred grams of protein a day, when I eat that protein, I'm getting signals to my brain to turn my, to those hunger, hunger signals off. So when you eat more protein, less carbohydrates, that usually fixes a lot of those. Um, give me some grain suggestions as well as substitute for chocolate. Any healthier suggestions? Yes. Um, healthier version of chocolate would be like Lily's chocolate. Okay. Um, L I L Lily's chocolate. Um, that's sweetened with stevia. You can get that on Amazon. You can get that at any like Whole Foods or Vitamin Cottage or natural grocers. You can get that anywhere. We're doing the shop with the doc class coming up with Dr. Ash. He's going to be doing that, I believe, next either next Monday or next Wednesday. You'll have to ask him in the office. Um, but he's going to be doing the shop with the doc class where he's going to take people to um, natural grocers and show you the seven staples that we get there and show you how we find those. And one of them is going to be the Lily's chocolates. Okay. Now grain alternatives, um, that would be things like Siete flour, Siete brand tortillas. Okay. So Siete, um, is the, is the brand. That's it. Yep. Siete tortillas. So they have almond flour tortillas and they have cassava flour tortillas, which are going to be much better for you, especially on the advanced plan. Um, those are going to be the big ones. Um, long-term uh, quinoa is a really good one. Lower on the glycemic index. It doesn't mess your hormones up nearly as much. Uh, it doesn't affect your leptin levels. So uh, it's actually considered a seed. So quinoa is a good one instead of things like rice or potatoes. Uh, Mike asks, are there any suggested supplements we should not be taking at the same time? Not really. That kind of depends on everybody, um, uh, everybody individually. 
So most supplements are going to be okay. The only reason I wouldn't want you taking more supplements than you need is because it's just, there's no reason to take it. Like some people take like four supplements to do the exact same thing. Right. So I try to reduce the amount of supplements that I'm taking. I still take, you know, several, but I have a lot of people come in, they're taking like 12, 13 things a day and four of them do the exact same thing. And they're just, you know, not getting a whole lot of benefit from that. So, um, so yeah, that's the, that's the answer on that. Good questions. Please explain the sh total sugars on an item. Sometimes there's another section that says added sugars. Yeah, that's a good question. So you should get no more than 25 grams of added sugar um, per day. That's where that stat comes from. But if you get 20 grams of total sugar, right? So if it says added sugar, I don't think you would see a label that said 20 grams of total sugar and then 25 grams of added sugar. Total sugar is total sugar. So when I say you're looking at sugar, you're trying to avoid like that's the total sugar that you're looking at. So we probably go back and look at one of these here. Um, here. So we have sugars, right? And other carbs, right? So what you're looking at here is total sugar. When you're trying to find net carbohydrates, you're looking at carbs minus fiber, okay? Because the more fiber you have, the less it impacts your body. So eating fiber is a good thing. More fiber is a good thing. So carbohydrates is <clears throat> your total carbohydrates here is going to be 18 grams, right? So 18 grams minus five is 13, right? 13 grams of net carbohydrates. Um, let's see if we find another added sugar somewhere. Uh, again here, carbohydrates here. If we look at carbohydrates versus uh, fiber, there's no fiber in there. So that's 36 grams of carbohydrates. That's a lot of carbs. Remember, if you're trying to keep it to 120 or less. 30, 36 grams, but if you eat this whole bag, it's it's 100 grams. It's more than you should eat in a whole day. Um, so you see sugars right there. Total sugars is what you're looking at. Um, so if we go back to here, yeah. So if, yeah, so so total sugars, added sugars. So that's 39 grams. Is it's not 39 plus 39. It's 39, but it's all added sugar. It means there's no there's no naturally occurring sugar in there, right? So sugars would be natural sugar, and then they have to list added sugar, right? So you want to avoid that because it's got 39 grams of sugar in it. All the carbohydrates are sugar, 39, 39, 39. So hopefully that makes sense. Yes, yeah, so the code, yeah, so hopefully that'll make sense to you. Cook at added sugar. That What that means is it's all added sugar, right? If this said added sugar down here and there, say there was 20 up here and added sugar of 23, then it would be, the, or, or added sugar of 10, then you still want to look at total sugar there, okay? Um, do you have a recommendation for the amount of stevia or safe sugar you should stay under in a day? So no, not typically. So don't call it safe sugar because it's not sugar. Um, but I know she's talking about sugar alternative. Um, so not typically. So if you have, you eat a lot of xylitol, you can have some digestive issues. So that would just kind of listen to some feedback from your body. But no, um, I, I, if you have a severe problem with, with like the sweet tooth, I try this, my, my rule of thumb is I try to eat things that are sweetened to like my tolerance. So I try to get my sugar tolerance down a little bit. So if I could put five drops of stevia or three drops of stevia in my tea and it tastes okay with three, I'll do three because I don't want to train my body to need things overly sweet all the time. So hopefully that makes sense. But in terms of like grams, no, I don't really worry uh, too much about that. I just don't want to train my body to, to do things that are crazy sweet. For instance, like this vitamin water here, I water that down. So I drink these pretty regularly, but I'll do, I'll drink, I'll put that in a cup and then about the same amount of water and then I'll put some ice in there because it, otherwise it's just too sweet. And over time, your taste buds start to change. Yeah, that's a great question. Awesome. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Yep. So um, when is the best time to take the detox antioxidant and the inflammatone? Um, anytime actually is fine. So detox antioxidants is going to be that you're giving your body cofactors. Um, same thing with the inflammatone. If you take, if you're trying to get the most powerful anti-inflammatory effect for the inflammatone though, I will say, take that out of empty stomach. Okay. So between meals, if that's going to keep you from actually taking it, then go ahead and take it with a meal. But between meals is going to be the most anti-inflammatory effect uh, for the inflammatone because it's going to get more, it's going to get into your system a lot quicker that way. All right. Great questions, everybody. I think that's uh, that's about it. So just want to encourage you guys, take the things that we learned tonight on building those new healthy habits and just tell people what you know. Another great way to you know establish you know your success and, and, and make sure that you're succeeding is become a teacher for somebody else, 
you know? So, so go teach this to somebody, go tell somebody, bring someone to the next workshop, show them what we do. Because when you do that, you're, you're spreading the word and you're creating, you know, more people thinking like us, which is what we need on this planet right now um, to change the consciousness of what's going on out there. It's becoming so much about sick care and the easy way out. We need more people with this growth mindset. So thanks for being on today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to record this and probably send this out in an email. So if you want to review it, you can. You can also share this with anybody that you know. Um, if you want to reach out to Tony, you can do that at this number right down here. And if you have any questions, you can always get a hold of us at the office. Well, I really appreciate everybody being on tonight. Bless you. Have a wonderful Monday night.